Okay, well, welcome back from the break. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, um, kind of shift a little bit, using the same theme though, of um, uh, not standing still, not straining forward, um, is how one crosses the flood to kind of uh, broaden that from what we were talking about in terms of a, the middle path, uh, broadening uh, the scope to a bit more of a far-reaching interpretation of the, of the sutta, uh, something pointing more towards um, the actual experience of, of uh, just being removed from the flood, uh, you know, removing oneself from the flood altogether um, after the skillful approaches of the middle way of the path have uh, been undertaken and practiced and developed, um, then um, what actually, you know, what's, what actually happens? And I'm gonna, I don't know how many people, how many people had a chance to read this uh, essay that suggested a verb for Nirvana that was on the uh, website? A few, few people, okay. Um, so I'm gonna read a good chunk of it uh, out because it's, uh, I think it's a very useful um, uh, way of explaining uh, the more transcendent ultimate parts of the path, the uh, aspect of, of what is the, uh, you know, what's the end point of practice, if you will. Uh, and this is a, an essay by Ajahn Tanisaro, uh, Tanisaro Bhikkhu, Ajahn Jeff, uh, called A Verb for Nirvana. And he's using the Sanskrit Nirvana for the Pali, Nibbana, because it's more common. Back in the days of the Buddha, Nirvana, or Nibbana, had a verb of its own, Nibutti. It meant to go out like a flame. Because fire was thought to be in a state of entrapment as it burned, both clinging to and trapped by the fuel on which it fed, its going out was seen as an unbinding. To go out was to be unbound. Sometimes another verb was used, parinibhuti, with the pari meaning total or all around, to indicate that the person unbound, unlike fire unbound, would never again be trapped. Now that nirvana has become an English word, it should have its own English verb to convey the sense of being unbound as well. At present, we say that a person reaches nirvana or enters nirvana, implying that nibbana is a place where you can go. But nirvana is most emphatically not a place. It's realized only when the mind stops defining itself in terms of a place, of here or there or between the two. This may seem like a word chopper's problem. What can a verb or two do to your practice? But the idea of nirvana as a place has created severe mis misunderstandings in the past, and it could easily create misunderstandings now. There was a time when some philosophers in India reasoned that if nirvana is one place and sangsara another, then entering into nirvana leaves you stuck. You've limited your range of movement, for you can't get back to sangsara. Thus, to solve this problem, they invented what they thought was a new kind of nirvana, in unestablished nirvana, in which one could be in both places, nirvana and sangsara, at once. However, these philosophers misunderstood two important points about the Buddha's teachings. The first was that neither sangsara nor nirvana is a place. Sangsara is a process of creating places, even whole worlds. This is called becoming. And then wandering through them. This is called birth. Nirvana is the end of this process. You may be able to be in two places at once or even develop a sense of self so infinite that you occupy all places at once. But you can't feed a process and experience its end at the same time. You're either feeding sangsara or you're not. If you feel the need to course freely through both sangsara and nirvana, you're simply engaging in more sangsara-ing and keeping yourself trapped. 
The second point is that nirvana, from the very beginning, was realized through unestablished consciousness, one that doesn't come or go or stay in place. There's no way that anything unestablished can get stuck anywhere at all, for it's not only non-localized, but also undefined. The idea of a religious ideal as lying beyond space and definition is not exclusive to the Buddha's teachings, but issues of locality and definition in the Buddha's eyes had a specific psychological meaning. This is why the non-locality of nirvana is important to understand. Just as all phenomena are rooted in desire, consciousness localizes itself through passion. Passion is what creates the there on which consciousness can land or get established. Whether the there is a form, feeling, perception, thought construct, or a type of consciousness itself. You'll recognize that as the five khandhas. Once consciousness gets established on any of these khandhas or aggregates, it becomes attached and then proliferates, feeding on everything around it and creating all sorts of havoc. Wherever there's attachment, that's where you get defined as a being. You create an identity there, and in doing so, you're limited there. Even if the there is an infinite sense of awareness, grounding, surrounding, or permeating everything else, it's still limited. For grounding and so forth are aspects of place. Wherever there's place, no matter how subtle, Passion lies latent, looking for more food to feed on. If, however, the passion can be removed, there's no more there, there. <laughs> nice little play on words. And I'm going to kind of uh, insert uh, a bit of a reading. Um, Oops, and I might have not brought the right book. Well, well, I did. I think I got it. Yeah. start uh, back where I left off there. Um, if, however, the passion can be removed, there's no more there, there. Where there is passion, delight, and craving, consciousness lands there and grows. Where consciousness lands and grows, name and, for name and form alights. Where name and form alights, there is the growth of fabrications. Where there is the growth of fabrications, there is the production of renewed becoming in the future. Where there is the production of renewed becoming in the future, there is future birth, aging, and death, together, I tell you, with sorrow, affliction, and despair. So this is from uh, the Sanyutta Nikaya 12.64. That's the actual quote from the, uh, the sutta that I was just reading. Where there, is no where there is no passion, where there is no delight, no craving, then consciousness does not land there or grow. Where consciousness does not land or grow, name and form does not alight. Where name and form does not alight, there is no growth of fabrications. Where there is no growth of fabrications, there is no production of renewed becoming in the future. Where there is no production of renewed becoming in the future, there is no future birth, aging, and death. That, I tell you, has no sorrow, affliction, or despair. Just as if there were a roofed house or a roofed hall having windows on the north, the south, or the east, when the sun rises and a ray has entered by way of the window, where does it land? On the western wall, Lord. And if there is no western wall, where does it land? On the ground, Lord. 
And if there is no ground, where does it land? On the water, Lord. And if there is no water, where does it land? It does not land, Lord. In the same way, when there is no passion, when there is no delight, no craving, then consciousness does not land there or grow. When consciousness does not land or grow, name and form does not alight. Where name and form does not alight, there is no growth of fabrications. Where there is no growth of fabrications, there is no production of renewed becoming in the future. Where there is no production of renewed becoming in the future, there is no future birth, aging, and death. That, I tell you, has no sorrow, affliction, or despair. So as you might recognize, the, uh, he's going through some of the steps of dependent origination, and it's um, also in, both in its causal and in its uh, 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 deconstruction process. This is why the consciousness of nirvana is said to be without, be without surface, anidasanam, for it doesn't land. Because the consciousness aggregate, vijnana, covers only consciousness that is near or far, past, present, or future, i.e. in connection with space and time, consciousness without surface is not included in the aggregates. It's not eternal because eternity is a function of time. And because non-local also means undefined, the Buddha insisted that an awakened person, unlike ordinary people, can't be located or defined in any, in any relation to the aggregates in this life. After death, he or she can't be described as existing, not existing, neither or both, because descriptions can only apply to definable things. So, I gave this as a reading for people to look at beforehand because it's a bit, uh, uh, you know, it can be hard to understand just by listening to it once. Um, it's something to um, read and consider uh, and reflect on. Um, it's quite, I think it's quite deep. Um, but um, it points to this kind of um, non-locality um, uh, that's not part of, uh, you know, like eternalism or annihilationism, the two extremes of existence or non-existence, um, but as to something that's really all altogether of a different dimension. Um, and it points to that whole phrase that we were, you know, reading in the sutta of, you know, neither uh, uh, sinking by standing still, you know, or getting swept away by, by pushing forward. Um, it's starting to hint at this uh, uh, non-locality aspect of, of, of consciousness that's, that's freed, uh, that isn't bound up uh, in samsara, in samsara-ing, I guess I should say, uh, the verb. John, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, so, what's the what's the nirvana verb? Uh, the, in English, I, I think did the he, best, he, the closest he, he comes to is it? is nirvana ing. <laughs> yeah, it's the closest. Uh, I'm not even sure. Actually, what he I think actually better. Um, he doesn't really actually say that it. Um, um, yeah, he talks about uh, nibuti uh, to go out uh, as the um, uh, Pali phrase nibuti, and so he would translate as uh, going out uh, as a sense. So that would probably be his his verb, going out. Um, but his point that I think is best taken is that. You know, sankhsara is this process of creating um, you know, places to be wandering around in and to be born into. And nirvana is the stopping of that. So it's, you know, the, the cooling or the stopping is best seen as a not doing of something rather than as a, a becoming something else. 
It's just the stopping of the doing, the stopping of the samsara And that, you know, when you contemplate that, that can, that has a real different effect than trying to get something or to go somewhere or to attain something. You know, when you think of all the things that your mind is constantly entwined with or engaged with or moving towards or moving away from, and then you're wanting freedom, then the freedom is actually in just stopping all that. You don't have to go any further than just stopping all that. You don't have to go somewhere else. You just stop it. And that's freedom. So that's the direction of, of how the mind moves into that kind of sphere of understanding. I think that the analogy of the flame going out is a good one, at least in my mind, because when I think like, okay, if there's a flame and it goes out, well, is there a non-flame there? Like, is there another thing right. there? It's like the uh, mind wants to create not a, something. Another thing. It's just like that one thing that was there right. is gone, but it's not replaced by some other thing. Yeah, yeah. That's you know the the story, the, the teaching from the Buddha is, is, you know, the question that's asked is, you know, when the flame goes out, where does it go? Does it go north, east, west, or south? And the Buddha says, well, it doesn't go north, east, west, or south, it goes out. <laughs> but yet, sometimes people pick that up as a, an annihilationist thing, that there is nothing, you know. Um, and that's another extreme that the Buddha says, well, it's not that, e you know, it's, it's, it's not that either. So this whole um, notion of, of, uh, of non-locality, you know, it's sort of like it's neither here nor there, um, nor in between. And we'll get to, actually, let me just do a reading that kind of points to that. It's a one, that, one that many people have heard of uh, before. It's the teaching to Bahia uh, that's in the Udana. Uh, and... Um, I won't read the, the whole sutta. Is, it's actually not that long, and it's really kind of a nice sutta, uh, but you might want to pick it up sometime. It's in uh, one of the lesser known uh, parts of the um, uh, uh, teachings. Uh, the Udana is one of the Nikayas, a smaller one of the sets. Um, and uh, Udana means like inspired utterances. Uh, and this one is in. Uh, the first chapter of the Udana, the last uh, sutta in the first chapter. And it's the teaching to Bahia. Uh, and just to summarize, essentially, that um, Bahia was a uh, uh, practitioner uh, living at the time of the Buddha, and um, he had done a lot of uh, different kinds of practices and thought he was uh, close to enlightenment, if not enlightened. And uh, a friend of his who had been reborn in a deva realm kind of came to him and said, you're not. <laughs> you know, you, you, you're, assuming, or you're assuming incorrectly. Um, and then um, he was uh, stirred uh, to go and uh, seek uh, the Buddha's advice. He found out about the Buddha and where the Buddha was and, and um, uh, sought him out. Uh, and... Um, pressed the Buddha for some teachings uh, and at first the Buddha refused because he was in the middle of alms round and Bahia insisted three times as, as it usually happens and then the Buddha said okay well you, you've asked me three times I need to do your teachings and he gives him a very um, very stiffy um, point of teaching and because Bahia had really done quite a bit of practice as long as time to, to understand and realize it uh, penetrate the teaching uh, very, very quickly. Here, by, here in Bahia, you should train yourself thus. In the seeing will be merely what is seen. In reference to the seeing, there will be only the seeing. In reference to the herd, only the herd. In reference to the sense, only the sense. In reference to the cognized, only the cognized. 
That is how you should train yourself. When for you there will be only the seen in reference to the seen, only the heard in reference to the heard, only the sense in reference to the sense, only the cognize in reference to the cognize. Then, Bahia, there is no you in connection with that. When there is no you in connection with that, there is no you there. When there is no you there, you are neither here, nor yonder, nor between the two. This, just this, is the end of suffering. So, the teacher in the Bahia pretty much immediately realized the at that point. And then he became liberated. And then he died uh, moments under the cap and the origin. So, he got it for this and done. But, uh, yeah, it's just a really profound teaching because it's pointing to, of course, the uh, the aspect of our experience that can be understood and regarded as not self. So that in any realm of sense experience, whether it's the process of seeing a form or hearing a sound or uh, experiencing a taste or a smell um, or a tactile sensation, any of the sense processes in the body or in uh, having a thought or an emotion experiencing those, that they can be experienced without the reference point of, a, of self, without it, without me, mine, or I being imputed into the whole experience. It's just the raw experience. The seen is the seen, the heard is the heard. The sense is the sense that comes back out of the cognize is the cognize. It's just these phenomena being picked up by a sense space, experience, and passing away without a sense of ownership, without a sense of self enmeshed with the whole thing, then um, the experiences are just as they are without imputing any kind of independent individual something to say meaning to them. And it points to that, and then the, the teaching here points to that sense again of that uh, non-locality. Um, when there is this experience of just the her, just the seen, only the sense, only the cognized in reference to that, then there is no you in connection with that. When there is no you in connection with that, there is no you there. There is no you there. You are neither here. Or there, no between the two. And this is the end of suffering. This is the end of suffering. Ajahn? Yes. So that is the experience of an arahant? That is the experience of an arahant. The experience of liberation. On a very deep breath. Uh, it's the experience of an arahant when it's complete. In your I think of just some other readings, but um, I think that's kind of enough to chew on with this. I think just to really emphasize that aspect of. Yeah, that uh, experience of, of consciousness um, that doesn't land uh, when there's no passion, no delight, the nutriment that is underlying the tendency of the mind wanting something, wanting to um, get something, wanting to be something, wanting to not be something. Those movements of mind, when, that, when we use the path um, to see and understand that clearly and let go of that kind of way of responding to the world around us through either trying to get or trying to get away from. When that stops, then um, the con consciousness, uh, which is always active in any particular sense base, 
uh, just has no fuel to go and attach itself, essentially, or land somewhere on a particular object. It doesn't mean that experience ceases. It just means that um, consciousness doesn't go out to something to draw it in uh, to its experience and to create something, uh, to create a world, uh, to create a, um, a whole proliferative uh, becoming process uh, so that the world, the experience of the world just becomes just what it is. It's just this, the, the input into the uh, sense base and the knowing of that uh, and the proliferation, the growing, the creation of a story, the creation of myself in the world, subject, object, uh, self, other, all of that just, it just stops. Uh, and, uh, you know, from the way the teachings describe it, this, you know, immense simplicity and clarity is what the result is without grasping, without clinging, without a sense of um, ownership, uh, identification. Uh, and this essentially is this form of consciousness, as, as it's described, um, that's not discriminatory, or it's not, uh, yeah, it's not discriminating into one of the sense realms. It's just a freed form of consciousness. It doesn't land, it doesn't create, it doesn't proliferate. It just uh, is um, sort of a different, different form, essentially, of, of uh, viewing the world, a different way of viewing the world of experience uh, that uh, is essentially what the arahant experiences uh, once they're completely released. That's how their consciousness operates, uh, is without landing growth and proliferation. So it's neither here nor there nor in between the two. It's removed from that whole, from the whole realm, in, in a sense of, of becoming birth, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, based on on.